prevent these injuries in our female athletes, we, we can't prevent them all, um, but we can certainly do a good job of preventing some of them. So next, I'm gonna spend some time talking about what else we can control, and that's our surgical technique. So we'll talk a little bit about graft, uh, tunnels, and some extras. So grafts, most common grafts we use are BTB, quad, and hamstring, and that's what we'll focus on talking about. So there is tons of literature looking at this. Um, this was one prospective randomized study um, with five-year follow-up that demonstrated that both hamstring and patellar tendon grafts had good outcomes and objective stability at five years. There were no significant differences except patients with patellar tendon grafts had a greater prevalence of osteoarthritis at five years after surgery. So if we look at just some of the studies that are out there comparing mostly hamstring and uh, patellar tendon, because quad is not quite as uh, traditional, even though I think it's a big up and comer, there's a lot of data out there. We can go on and on about looking at the differences and the nuances and different studies and you know, other things. And I think if it's done well, you're going to have a good outcome. But there are some things we can consider. Most studies do show that there is a higher chance of having anterior knee pain with patellar tendon versus a hamstring. And then here I've just shown some of the differences with graft harvest morbidity. So patellar tendon, quad tendon, you have more loss of sensation from your incision, more anterior knee pain, increased risk of osteoarthritis, you have a risk of fracture, hamstring, much less risk of loss of sensation, less anterior knee pain. Those tendons do tend to regrow or scar back in and less chance of osteoarthritis. So sometimes hamstring is not the most popular graph here in the US. It is the most popular graph when we look at the entire world. And so part of this talk is gonna be, don't forget about your hamstrings and we'll see why. So this was a study that looked at over 500 athletes followed for two years. Uh, they were all used, all the ACL reconstructions used a primary autograph hamstring single surgeon, same technique. What it showed was that females, younger patients, and graft sizes less than eight millimeters had a much higher risk of retear. So graft size matters. These are all studies that show that ACL grafts less than eight millimeters in diameter at, are at an increased risk for failure. The Moon Group showed us that larger grafts had superior outcomes, especially looking at the coos. Um, and grafts ranging from seven to nine millimeters in diameter have a 0.82 times lower likelihood of requiring revision surgery for every 0.5 millimeter increase in graft size. So in my operating room, we will not use anything less than nine millimeters, period. So that's the rule. No one gets less than nine millimeter graft. So you've got to think about how you're going to get that graft, especially in a small female athlete. So you think about a quadrupled hamstring. So it's reproducible, it has minimal morbidity, it leaves the extensor mechanism intact. And I don't exclusively use hamstrings, but I think you have to have this technique in your armamentarium when you're taking care of these female adolescent athletes. So if we look over here at this MRI, I mean, you can see the patellar tendon, it's got a width of 4.8 millimeters. You can see the quad tendon, it's much more robust. So the quad tendon, especially in a young female, even though it's still maybe on the smaller size, is going to be more robust than our patellar tendon. Uh, you can see harvesting a quad in the top right and then prepping a quadruple semitendinosis on the bottom. All right, so I know it's morning time. So this is a regular slice of bacon. And when I think about this, I think about a patellar tendon graft. It's like measuring a ribbon. It's like a piece of bacon. When you take your patellar tendon, your bone pieces are 10 millimeters or nine millimeters or whatever you decide you're gonna measure. But that actual graft, you're measuring a width, right? but it's not an actual diameter. And so if you were to cut the bone ends off of a patellar tendon graft, that actual tendon itself is probably, will fit through a six millimeter you know, uh, measure or dowel or something. So. You gotta be thoughtful about this. So when I think of just a regular slice of bacon, that's like your BTB graft. Now here we've got a nice thick cut piece of bacon. So this is like your quad. It's much more robust. You got a lot more tendon. It's much thicker um, in all of our patients. So I think the quad is an excellent alternative. Um, you don't have to take 
you know, uh, bone with it. So a little bit less morbidity when you're harvesting. Um, you can always get enough length. It's a, it's a great graft. So this more thick cut piece of bacon is like your quad graft. But if you really want something meaty, this is your Canadian bacon. And this is really, this is a true diameter. And this is more like your quadrupled hamstring. So you got to think about what you're harvesting, especially when you have a smaller patient where graft size is going to be smaller just because their, their anatomy is smaller. So how are you going to get that robust graft? So this is just a quick little video vignette of how we quadruple a semitendinosus. Um, it provides a robust graft every time. So again, my rule is knowing it's less than nine millimeters in my operating room. Um, often if my semi-T doesn't give me a minimum nine millimeter graft, I just grab the gracilis, I'll quadruple the, the two of them together. And over time, and you'll see some studies here in a second, I've actually almost always taken them, you know, and now I can get a 10 millimeter in my female athletes with taking my semi-T and gracilis. Why not? So now we usually will just take both. This was a study we did that just shows that you can actually predict that graph length and size for your surgery. So if I harvest the semi-T and I know if, if I measure the width of it, I'm not going to have a nine millimeter graph right off the bat. I just take gracilis and then we go prepare the two of them on the back table. So in God we trust, all others bring data. So what does all this mean? So we actually tried to make sure this actually does mean something. So we looked at 100 patients that all had the same surgical technique with a quadrupled semitendinosus tendon. No one received smaller than a nine millimeter graph. So the mean graph diameter for females was 9.4. For males, it was 9.8. And what we were able to show that two-year outcomes were comparable. So there were the outcome scores at two years were not lower for our females. Um, and the risk of you know, revision or retear was no different between our males and females. So, and this is 100% same fixation, same technique. You know, you know, and this is just providing our females with an adequate graph size. So if we look at this here, if you look at that yellow line on the bottom, that is, this is a global database. And what I just quickly just pulled Mark's activity score out of the global database. So this is all comers, all graph sizes. I don't know what graph sizes were used, but clearly this global female line is lower than everything else. If you look at the green line in the center, that's the global males. And then what I did was I pulled out my ACLs in this global database. And every single one of these females should have had at least a nine millimeter graph. And you can see the red line there at least normalizes the outcomes of those females with the global males. So it's something that you really need to think about. We have a lot more research trying to determine you know, how important this is. But if you're asking me, I think it's extremely important that when we look at the data, then that first slide I showed you where females have poor outcomes, higher risk of retear, I think it's because historically they were getting graphs that were too small, right? So when we look way back at the literature on hamstring tendons that were used 10, 15 years ago, a six, seven, eight millimeter graft. Um, and I think that's why they had higher risk of retear and poor outcomes. So we need to change that. So there's no single graft choice that's been definitively shown to have superior outcomes. So it definitely remains a topic of debate, but something you need to think about. All right, so next we'll talk a little bit about technique. So anatomic tunnel placement is paramount to success in ACL reconstruction period, male athlete, female athlete, it doesn't matter. So when we drill our femoral tunnels, we can be transtibial, we can do intermedial, or we can use an independent femoral guide. So I use an independent femoral guide because it allows me to put this tunnel anywhere I want in any knee. Um, I'm not restrained by you know, a really big knee that's hard to hyperflex if I'm going through my intermedial portal if my transtibial tunnel is not quite right. So I would highly recommend considering an independent femoral guide for all your ACL reconstructions. This is a study that just demonstrates that using an outside in technique, you were able to be more anatomically correct. You could get a longer femoral tunnel length compared to using an intermedial portal technique. And I think this has been shown over and over again. This was just a really good study that CT scanned all their patients uh, demonstrating this. So, 
Uh, this is just why I like to use an outside in guide, why I like to use a retrograde reamer. Um, I can put it anywhere I want. I don't have to hyperflex the knee. I can view the tunnel from my intermedial portal. I can get a longer socket. I don't have to worry about back wall blowout. So the other reason that I am a big fan now of all inside ACL reconstruction is because of the fixation. And it took me a long time to uh, trust my cortical button fixation. And I transitioned slowly over many years, but over the last 10 years, I've used cortical button fixation on both my femoral and tibial tunnel sides, uh, really because in my hands, I can incrementally um, tighten those, those grafts until I'm happy. So if you use a screw, once that screw goes in, you've kind of got what you've got. But with these buttons, I can tighten my graft, cycle my knee, check it again, and I can tighten it in my hands until it's as tight as I want it to be. Whereas with the screw, you have to pull as hard as you can, you have to put your screw in. Um, and so this has been a really useful technique for me. With my soft tissue grafts, I'll put them in as tight as I can. So this is just a quick, video showing this technique. Let's see if it'll play. So here's the outside in femoral guide. Um, makes it really easy to put this on the femoral wall wherever I think I need to be. We can retrograde drill in. The guide is usually set at 105 to 110 degrees. Um, we'll use the retrograde drill to make our tunnel at a diameter equal to the graft diameter. Usually I'll make my femoral tunnel 27 to 30 millimeters long. It's plenty long if you're doing an all inside technique. I'll send a suture loop through. That's what we'll use for later graft passage. Uh, tibial tunnel is pretty much drilled in a similar fashion. The guide is set at 55 to 60 degrees right in that anatomic footprint. The retrograde drill again um, set at the same diameter of the graft size, which is gonna be usually a nine or 10 uh, and then I will make about a 35 to 40 millimeter tibial tunnel. You don't have to make it any bigger than that. It'll give you plenty of room to get your graft in and tighten it down. We pass the suture uh, and then we'll pull both sutures out through the same anteromedial portal. And it's really important that all sutures come through the same uh, plane. So there's not any tissue bridges when you're gonna insert your graft using an all inside technique. Here we can see our graph going in. Um, I have marks on the graph at 20 millimeters usually on each side. That allows me to make sure I put at least 20 millimeters into each tunnel. We'll pull our graft in, we'll flip our button, and then we can kind of shuttle the graft in on the femoral side. And again, I'll shuttle it to about my mark, and then we'll dip our tibial side of the graft, and I can keep tightening this until I'm happy. You'll see I'll tighten both sides, I'll cycle it, I'll go back and check it and tighten it some more until that graft's as tight as I want it to be in the end. So I think this is a very easy way to be anatomic. Anatomic is paramount to successful ACL reconstruction. Again, you don't need to hyperflex the knee. You don't need an accessory medial portal. You don't have to worry about back wall blowout. You don't have to worry about short sockets, especially in a small female where their, their femur is not that big to begin with and you probably only get 30 millimeters max. You can use that adjustable cortical fixation that really can allow you to dial in the tension until you're happy. Um, and remember, graph size matters. So what else can we do? What else can we do to make um, ACL reconstruction better for our female athletes? So we'll talk a little bit about each of these that I've listed here. So interlateral ligament reconstruction can improve knee stability alongside an ACL. There's been a lot of studies looking at this. Um, and whether you use an ALL or an LET, it hasn't really mattered. I think this study showed that both of them can be considered to improve rotational stability and subjective function. In this study here, ALL appeared to be a better option for improving rotational stability compared to an LET, uh, but I think both can help. Um, and they can provide that little bit of extra. Um, most of the time in my female athletes, unless they're very back in a primary ACL, I'm not usually using an ALL or an LET, but almost always for my revisions. So this study, again, um, this is the stability study um, with Alan Getgood. 
This is a multi-center prospective randomized clinical trial. It's the best we've got, and there'll be more data to come, but this was their first publication. Um, they've looked at over 600 patients, and what they showed was that the addition of an LET to a single bundle hamstring tendon autograph ACL in young patients at high risk of failure had statistically significant clinically relevant reduction in graft rupture and rotatory laxity at two years after surgery. So using an LET or an ALL for that matter is something to consider. So this is just uh, what the modified or Lemire looks like or an LET looks like. So you can do it through a fairly small incision on the lateral side. Uh, you can take a slip of your iliotibial uh, graft, you can slide it under your LCL, um, and then you can fix it on the femur. So it's pretty quick and easy to do it. Um, I don't have a, a big thought on whether LAT or ALL is better. Um, it's usually patient dependent or, or the fellow who's scrubbing with me dependent on which technique they want to use whether you're gonna use a graft or you're just gonna use IT band. So what about suture augmentation or internal brace? I'm not totally sure what to think of this. The studies out there aren't that great, um, but you know, this could be a seatbelt to your ACL. I think it makes sense in some cases. I certainly would be thoughtful and careful about not over tensioning that internal brace or suture augmentation. Uh, it's out there something to consider. I'm not sure where to go with that quite yet. And what about ACL repair? So ACL repair has been around for a really long time. It went out of favor because there were so many early failures, uh, but it is starting to creep back in. So what do we think about it? So these were some of the earlier studies that looked at the uh, failures of ACL repair. So you gotta be careful. Um, about whether or not you wanna repeat this. There are new techniques that are being pushed, uh, but if you look at right now the facts, failures after an ACL reconstruction are about less than 5% overall. Failures after ACL repair are still 10 to 30%. Um, and then I'll mention the bear technique here in a second. But So this was just looking at some of the newer studies that are trying to push ACL repair. Uh, but most of these studies have pretty big limitations, small numbers and short duration of follow-up. Again, small numbers, 23 ACL repairs versus 21 ACL reconstructions. Um, they think it might be a viable treatment options for patients. This one looked at ACL repair in just athletes, uh, concluding that there's really insufficient evidence to recommend ACL repair um, as a preferred method. I think the other thing to think about is that if you're going to do an ACL repair, you have to have an ACL tear that pretty much shears right off the femoral wall. So not all ACL tears are even a candidate for a repair. Uh, and I'm not sure I would jump to do this in my female athletes yet, but there are some promising studies that you know, show they may be getting back to sports quicker, um, a lower risk of of concern with proprioception and fear of re-injury and other things like that. So something to think about. Um, this one just looked at repair with that internal brace, uh, suggesting that it could be considered as an alternative. And this was the last current concepts review on this. And I think it basically states that ACL reconstruction remains the gold standard uh, for patients with ACL tears. So we'll see where this goes in the future. This is just a little video that shows this new technique on how we're doing these ACL repairs. Let's see if it'll play. Uh, so again, you can see this is a very proximal ACL tear. It's sheared right off the femoral wall. Not all ACL tears look like this, so they're not all amenable to repair in the first place, but you can send two loop sutures through that proximal aspect of the ACL. Um, and then you can just take a four millimeter uh, drill and you can create a pretty small tunnel up the femoral side, uh, pull these up. This is done with a suture augmentation or internal brace um, that gets pulled right down through the tibial footprint through a small little drill hole. It looks pretty nice. Um, I have not done one in an adolescent female athlete yet. Um, I'm not sure I'd, I'd like to see more data before I go there, but we'll see, we will see. 
Okay, so what about BEAR? So bridge enhanced ACL reconstruction. So this is Dr. Martha Murray. She spent the last 20 years of her career basically studying uh, ACL and how we can try and get it to heal itself and repair. And um, this is now FDA approved. So this is a scaffold. Uh, so just like with an ACL repair, you need a very specific type of ACL tear right off the femoral wall for a bare technique. You need a mid-substance ACL tear as demonstrated here in the MRI or this technique won't work. So there's some suturing, scaffold goes around um, and they've had some good results as well. So this is their uh, published study in uh, AJSM. This was a level one randomized controlled study. They had 100 patients, 65 who had the bare technique, 35 with a regular ACL reconstruction, of which most of them were a quadrupled hamstring. Um, and what they demonstrated was that the bare resulted in non-inferior patient-reported outcomes with knee laxity. Uh, they said that they had better hamstring strength, which is somewhat obvious because they didn't harvest their hamstrings in the bare patients. Um, but the data is yet to come. They've now um, opened this up to a multi-centered trial. Uh, so we'll see where this bear technique ends up. But again, I think there's going to be a niche for it, but it's not going to be for everyone. It's something to think about in the future. So again, great things are not accomplished by those who yield to trends and fads and popular opinions. So we need to sometimes stick to what we know. Lastly, post-operative rehab, return to sport. So return to sport depends on individualized surgical factors. Are there other injuries? Um, what are the goals of the patient? I mean, someone who's getting back to swimming after an ACL injury may have a very different rehab than someone who's getting back to soccer, basketball, skiing. So everything needs to be individualized. And I think the biggest thing for our female athletes is thinking about the psychological aspect of it when we've looked at most of the studies. So this is just a study that showed the longer we can delay these athletes from return to sport, the lower their risk of re-injury. So when I trained as a fellow, it was just six months. You, six months out from an ACL, off you go, return to whatever you want. Now we're really pushing to get them out to eight, nine months. So eight is probably a minimum for me, uh, but I'd like to get them to nine, 10 months. I mean even longer if I could. So I think waiting as long as we can for them to really regain their symmetrical muscle function, their quad strength, their equivalent <clears throat> hamstring strength in our females, super important to avoid that second ACL injury. But I think what a lot of the literature has also shown that especially in our females, they're more likely to change their expectations and stop sports participation. And a lot of that is that fear of re-injury and the psychological nature of it. Um, and this has been shown in many very, very good studies. Um, this was a review uh, that demonstrated it, that this was another review that looked at psychological aspects of recovery after ACL. Um, and this is really important. And I don't think that it means that every female ACL patient needs to go see a sports psychologist. Some do, some are gonna really benefit from it. But even just talking to them about it and saying that, yes, I understand you're, you know, you're probably terrified to get back. That's normal. Justifying that those thoughts and that fear they have is normal is sometimes all they need to hear to kind of continue to move on. Because the last thing we want is to do surgery on these patients so they can get back to their sports and then they don't get back to it. So psychological response before surgery and early recovery were associated with returning to pre-injury level of sports at 12 months. So we need to pay attention to psychological recovery. So both our physical and our mental recovery are going to be very important in getting every athlete back out on the field. This was another study out of there that just demonstrated, and this was this is they collect very good psychological scores on all these patients. So that the bear patients actually had um, less anxiety, less fear of return to sport in this um, in this study, which I thought was interesting. So this is our 16-year-old female lacrosse player. Uh, she's 5'1", 110 pounds with a BMI of 22. So you got to start thinking about this. She's, you know, hoping to play collegiate lacrosse someday. Um, she had a non-contact valgus injury. She's got an isolated ACL tear in this small knee. Um, so no other injuries, no meniscal, no varus, no valgus laxity, nothing else going on. So 
easy case, but you got to consider this individual's goals. I mean, she wants to play collegiate lacrosse. She's a female, high risk. You know, what kind of graft are you going to give her? How are you going to give her a graft of adequate size so she can get back to doing what she wants? Think about your meticulous surgical technique. Does she need augmentation? What other options are out there? How are you going to rehab her? And how are you going to address those psychological aspects? So we need more research on all of this. So meticulous technique, robust graft every time. Uh, I would advocate for nothing less than nine millimeters in any patient, but especially these females. I love my quadrupled hamstring. I do a lot of quad. Um, I don't think that <laughs> you have, there's one graft necessarily better than the other, but I would just make sure you're able to use different graphs, being comfortable with them so you can make sure every athlete gets what they need. So the more we learn, the more we realize how little we know. Um, I think the more we delve into this, the more we, we have to learn more and more and more. So it's a journey. Um, I think that's why sports medicine or orthopedics is, is so much fun because uh, the more we learn, the more, the more we have to learn. So if that made no sense, I get it. Um, it's a lot. So that's how I felt as a sports fellow. I was the first female um, sports fellow at Duke under Dr. Mormon. Um, I learned a ton in his operating room, some of which I keep with me today, but a lot of which has changed. So this is an ever-changing field. And I hope that I'm not doing my female ACLs the same way I am today as in 10 years. So hopefully everything continues to evolve. This is my graduating medical school class. I'm hiding over here somewhere, but if you look over here, you can see this one. So I actually met um, Dr. Shu. It wasn't the first day of medical school. It was certainly the first week. Um, and I, I pretty much went to medical school thinking I was doing orthopedics. And when I met Dr. Shu, he was going to medical school thinking he was doing pediatrics. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> and um, we actually were on the same, um, we put on our surgical rotation together randomly. And back in the day, that was at Charity Hospital. And you know, you'd be up at 3 a.m. running around Charity Hospital, which it was, it was insane. Um, they still had an actual jail in the hospital so you, you know as a medical student we'd have to go round on patients in the jail you have to you know knock on the door and then you have to take off your white coat make sure you didn't have pens anything on you you have to go into the rock everyone's chained to these metal beds and they're, they're clanking them hey doc hey doc and joe and i would have to go in there and so but we did this general surgery rotation and we had amazing chief residents and back then at charity hospital attendings were almost never seen and the chief residents really ran the service and um, that's where Joe fell in love with surgery and then orthopedic surgery and never looked back. So then we got to complete our journey through medical school together. He, he was a late decider in orthopedics um, and luckily Tulane liked him enough to keep him um, and here he is now. So we spent a lot of time together through medical school uh, we had a lot of good times. Uh, this is a picture of us at the cadaver ball. Um, Joe was a groomsman in my wedding. And whenever I get a chance to see him, we like to, oops, hang out. So thank you for having me. Um, I would love to take questions um, from any of you. Liz, thanks for your fantastic talk and um, one comment, one question. Um, I think it's fantastic that you were able to get your own series developed in the way that you have because, as you know, ACL is such craftsmanship. I don't know how you can compare a quadrupled hamstring graft to what Alan Gatgood's doing, single strand hamstring. Of course he needs an LAT, right? You would say that, I suspect. But that's a lot different. Um, that's a lot different technique, a lot different graft. And, you, congratulations on being really diligent about every aspect of it, the fixation, the graft, the rehab, and, and so forth. So that, that's my comment. Um, my question is that um, 
both of our mentor, Bill Garrett, was pretty insistent that valgus was not a component of ACL injury. How have you reconciled that? Because you're still talking about valgus. Yeah, well, I'm not doing any research on that aspect of it. So, I mean, but that's what's out there in the literature. Yeah. Um, so I don't, you know, again, I can't control anatomy, right? You know, so I don't, I think there's an anatomical valgus that, you know, I don't know if that plays a role, but I do think that uh, the female athletes that fall into valgus from a jump landing, um, just because they have weak proximal muscles, that potentially I think plays a role with our neuromuscular training. But, um, but you know, it's what I, what I mean. The more we learn, the, the less we know. I don't know the answer to that. There's a question for you. So I, full disclosure, I have not touched uh, an ACL reconstruction in probably 19 years. Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's great news for all the ACLs around here. Um, but one of the things that I'm probably still scarred by in harvesting hamstrings is the length of the tendon. Everybody's, you know, sawed one off a little early. So, you know, obviously it makes a lot of sense to double it up, but how do you, you know, is, is that 20 millimeters, the ideal length? I always feel like we always wanted it longer, longer, longer. You mean into and, the tunnels? Yeah. And in terms of, yeah, we wanted it longer to have more in the tunnel for, you know, more ingrowth, whatever it may be. And that would just from a true lay person in this world, that would, would is what would scare me looking at that is just the amount of uh, graft you have in the tunnel to grab. Yes, yeah, so that's, you know, I thought about this a lot. So, you know, and I trained and we put these graphs through the whole tunnel and, you know, but there's been very good studies that you don't. And when you think about like, when we repair a distal biceps tendon or a flexor tendon, I mean, we just repair the tendon to the bone. We don't have to tunnel it all the way through and it heals. Um, so there have been very good studies, um, a lot out of, of Asia and Korea, looking at just putting five millimeters of graft into a tunnel and they do fine. So I'm not so sure I recommend the five millimeters, but you don't, you don't expect that graft to heal for 30 millimeters. I mean, really, you just need it to heal into the bone at the femoral tunnel where it enters. So, you know, and I think there's some tentativeness and there certainly was for me 10 years ago when I started switching to this technique about that, but, you know, 15, 20 millimeters into a tunnel. And there's no study that there's been no really good, like, you know, ovine or goat or rabbit model study that has demonstrated how much you actually need in a tunnel, because I think it just would take so much work. No one's actually really done that study. Um, but there have been published clinical studies where they've put very little graft in the tunnel and they've done it fine. Hey, Liz, this is a, a Pat Connor. Can you, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I really appreciated your talk and uh, uh, enjoyed listening to it. I have a quick question about the LET ALL uh, deal. Uh, I think many of us have, <clears throat> have uh, moved to using uh, lateral augmentation uh, one way or the other in our revisions and in those that are high risk. And my question is, uh, Clearly, the female athlete with failure rates up in the mid 20 percent in some female athletic uh, uh, soccer studies, et cetera, uh, if you're using them all in or using them in all revisions, <clears throat> uh, what what is preventing you from using, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the lateral augmentation or AOL in primaries uh, in, in uh, these young female high risk uh, uh, athletes? Uh, rather than just revisions is there a reason is it is it due to morbidity have you had some complications with or some re reasons why not because i think a lot of people have kind of moved that way and uh, i think a lot of us are are working on that balance i think that's a great question i i worry a little bit i mean i think one you have to be very careful not to over tighten your let or all um and so technique is really important but two i don't there have been some studies that have shown that you can change the, the rotational stability almost too much. And I don't know what the long-term effects of that are. Um, so I think we'll see. I think the stability study is going to give us a lot of answers, but we need a couple more years to get those answers. And so in a female patient, if I have concern and they're just hyper lax and I just have a 
I don't know, you see some of those lanky female adolescent athletes that come in. I, I, I think it's great to augment it with an LET or an ALL, but I'm still not doing it on everyone. I do think there is some morbidity to it. I mean, it's more, it's bigger incision on the lateral side or it's extra fixation. Um, so I don't do it on everyone. So I do it on a handful of primaries if I have big concern, um, but the majority of revisions. But I, I don't I don't know the answer. To that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it more aggressively. I'm just not sure what the long, long term um, outcomes are going to be. I mean, are we going to create more osteoarthritis in 15, 20 years or is it going to be less? And I have no idea. But those are the things we start to think about. I have two questions for you, Dr. Maskin. Okay, so for the, the first, I appreciate um, the utility of using the quadruple hamstring to get that robust diameter and width. But in thinking about donor site morbidity in a female athlete where the hamstring to quad ratio is already low, do you think that using the hamstring autographed um, thus makes them weaker postoperatively? And do you think that is going to push you more towards using quad in the future? So I think about this a lot as well. So you're right, um, but the hamstrings can regenerate to a certain degree. And so every patient that tears their ACL, no matter what graph you use, even if you use an allograph, not hopefully in an adolescent, but um, they're gonna have weakness post-op, period. Um, and you know when some of the studies have looked at that ratio and the hamstrings are gonna be weak, whether you use a patellar tendon, a quad tendon, or a hamstring tendon. And so it's up to our rehab and we've lengthened, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to get that strength back. Um, and I would turn that around and, you know, I'm not sure that messing with the extensor mechanism is good either, right? So I don't know, you know, I've, I haven't had a problem with, you know, patients getting their hamstring strength back. They, you know, if you didn't tell them what graph you took, they usually don't miss it. That being said, the quads do really well. Also, it made me nervous the first time I took my quad tendon graphs years ago, just thinking like, how, how can this be okay? Um, you know, we've taken patellar tendons for forever. I do worry about patellar tendon in a small female, because if you have like a, maybe a 20 millimeter patellar tendon and you think you're gonna take a nine millimeter graph, you don't leave them with very much. But I think if you're meticulous in your technique with whatever you take, they're gonna do okay. And when I say meticulous in your technique, I think minimizing morbidity when you're harvesting your graft, giving them a perfect reconstruction and then a perfect rehab. So it all adds up, but it's, it's, I don't know the answer to that, but if you rehab them properly and long enough, they should regain all of their proximal muscle strength. Can I just comment yeah. as, as a PT? <laughs> I appreciate Dr. Warren inviting me today. Um, rehabbing ACLs for 30 years. A couple of things. Um, think about when the ACL patient comes into the clinic. What's the first thing you guys look at? You want to see them fire the quad? You want to see them do a straight leg race? So immediately we're ignoring the hamstring. So through the years with the patellar tendon rehab, what's the first thing we want to get back? The quad. So sometimes the rehab will ignore the hamstring. So it's not that the hamstring won't regenerate, I agree. It's the fact that we don't spend enough time. The other comment I'll just make is that through the years, when I, when I first tore my ACL back a long time ago, now I got into this crazy business, his rehab was almost unlimited. Now we have 30 visits, maybe to rehab. So the therapist is going to get them out in 12 weeks, right? And the great doctors, you guys aren't going to let them go back to the field until nine months. So what are they doing between three months and nine months? That's why I feel years ago, our rehab was actually better than it is today because we had unlimited visits. So now the patient and the therapist, the surgeon's trying to figure out what do you do between three months and nine months, right? And then great point, anytime I can listen to an orthopedist, pull up JOSPT up there, kudos. <laughs> right? um, because the key is that you're forming a team with the therapy, the therapy staff, because they're gonna make you look really good. But the key is the psychosocial factors. So when you have a young athlete come in, the first two visits with them, or we automatically tell them, we're going to make you run faster than you've ever run before. Because there's no reason with three, six, nine months of rehab, why I can't make someone run faster. 
that that immediately gets them thinking, okay, I want to make it back. Because you're right. Females are much smarter than males. You think too much because you're thinking about all this other stuff. Males, we got a little D brain. All right, we're just thinking, oh, soccer ball, kick a ball, I'll get back. <laughs> right? But we have, to, we have to anticipate that, right? But the psychosocial, they're exactly right. They, there's a friendship, there's more social sports. But if we get them in their mindset, we're going to make them run faster, right? Track athletes typically don't tear their ACLs, so I can run them, all right? I can run them hard. And I, we don't let them cut until their speed's back to what it was pre-injury. Because when they come back on the field, the athlete never says, I don't feel as quick. They tell you their legs go heavy or I don't feel this fast. So my commitment to them is I'm going to make them run faster than they've ever run before. So that accomplishes a lot. But kudos to you, Liz. Great, great talk. My second question is actually a therapy kind of question as well. It's about neuromuscular training. I want to know what the source of the neuromuscular imbalance differences are between men and women. You know, like, are there men who move similarly to our female athletes? Are they at higher risk of getting ACL tears? And then also, when are, when are girls, when are adolescent females developing this, this difference in their neuromuscular imbalances? And is it something that we can teach them to do differently at a young age? Like, can we start neuromuscular training or ACL um, prevention training even younger. I think about like these CrossFit kids programs, which purportedly serve to in part teach kids how to move functionally better. And, you know, we can debate the quality of the coaching, but those kids are getting exposed to functional movements at like age seven, eight, nine, ten. Is it, is it beneficial to introduce little girls to this type of neuromuscular training? Yeah, I mean, hundred percent. I mean, the FIFA 11 plus, which is, you know, for soccer, I mean, it's, 15 minutes before every practice where it's, you know, some kind of neuromuscular type training should be incorporated into all of our youth programs, all of the town soccer programs. But the hard part is you have to remember that these, at that young age, the coaches are usually just volunteer parent coaches. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the towns don't have the money to support, you know, training everyone. But you know, there's been tons of studies looking at that. And yes, we should start at a young age. And yes, I mean, we see this in our male athletes for sure, but just not at the same um, percentage. I mean, it's much lower. Uh, and for whatever reason, whether it's a hormonal thing, but as our younger males develop, they tend to develop a little bit more balanced than our prepubertal females with their quad and hamstring ratio. Well, thank you. Thank awesome you. Uh, talk. We'll take a few minutes and then. Uh, back down. Oh, never mind. Thank you again, Dr. Matzkin.